I feel to be called a show of I guess she may hear the list and is Jenikin Jokovishif come The veil, the Zalyar, I guess, who fatter is who was a junior hat or no, Marshan Hashan Firva. Nisha, um, Marahamik Hami, a little is to be show, I guess, Haina Oran wants to be touched or that a young and ill grief. If you have a good time, you can get a good time. If you have a good time, you can get a good time. If you have a good time, you can get a good time. If I guess the Valam Tang Kujaka Horst, the last of Rob Erson of Viko Kenya, could have the Oran Isho, Tapolet Gitelever. I'm very happy indeed to be here this evening. It gives me great pleasure to address you as the O'Donnell lecturer. I well remember how back in the past I used to give lectures, um, I used to prepare for lecturers for O'Donnell. And I remember the fun of being in touch with them and setting up uh, the various rooms and liaising with Professor Gillis, who is here this evening. I think he did most of it, but I think it was combined ops, as I suspect it is still in the department. It was always a great occasion. We enjoyed having the visiting lecturers, and I'm delighted to stand in that tradition this evening. <coughs> I've given you a handout which I hope you will find useful. I realised as I went through my lecture before giving it that while many of the people mentioned here are old friends of mine, they've inhabited my brain for many a year. And if someone were to ask me if I knew Dougal Buchanan, I would probably say that I had seen him last night. <laughs> and at that stage of life, but I thought others may not be quite as familiar with the characters that I will mention. So I've given you very brief summaries of their significance in the handout, and I hope you will be able to follow these. I haven't been able to give much in the way of detail because I wanted to get everything onto one sheet of A4. So you have the basic information. What you will also have, I hope, is the main people in the order in which I will refer to them broadly. Some of them I'll put more flesh on their bones than I will do with others. But I hope this will make the lecture just a little easier to follow, particularly for those of you who may not be wholly familiar with the subject, as I've said. My theme then for this evening is the Gaelic Literary Enlightenment, the making of the Scottish Gaelic New Testament and associated books 1750 to 1820. You will notice, those of you who are eagle-eyed, that I have advanced my time scale by a decade compared with what was on the notice for this talk. I start at 1750 rather than 1760. But of course you could start much, much earlier and you could end much, much later. But let me just get to the theme of my talk. Since retiring in 2008, and I can scarcely believe that 10 years have passed since then and what wonderful years they've been. I warmly recommend retirement to absolutely everyone in this room, and the sooner the better. I have had the privilege of editing a number of Gallic religious texts, and particularly the poems of the 18th century poet Dougal Buchanan, who died in 1768, exactly 250 years ago. Back in 1992, a quarter of a century ago, and in fact, last century, as I'm sure you're aware, 
I completed an orthographic revision of the standard Gaelic Bible for the National Bible Society of Scotland. And I followed this with a diglot version of the Gaelic New Testament with a parallel English text in 2002. The Gaelic New Testament was first published in 1767 in Edinburgh on behalf of the Society in Scotland for Propagating Christian Knowledge by Balfour, Auld and Smiley, printers to the University of Edinburgh and the predecessors of Edinburgh University Press. The poet Dougal Buchanan attended the press in Edinburgh in the winters of 1766 and 1767 to supervise the printing of the New Testament. The Gallic New Testament thus celebrated the 250th anniversary of its own publication last year. The translation of the Old Testament was completed in its first forum in 1801. And then there was some revision which made the 1807 text pretty well the standard one for Gales thereafter. It therefore seemed appropriate, in light of the 250th, appropriate to devote the core of this O'Donnell lecture to the translating and publication of the Gallic New Testament, as well as to the achievement of Dougal Buchanan, and also to refer to the Old Testament, and to set all of these in the context of what is commonly known as the Scottish Enlightenment. At the same time, it seemed no less appropriate to discuss the contributions and qualities of the various other scholars who were involved in translating the New and Old Testaments, in addition to a range of other religious texts. Broadly speaking, the period which these foundational texts, in which these foundational texts were translated lies within the 70 years covered by the title of this lecture. Of course, Translation of religious works into Gaelic began 200 years earlier with the translation of the Book of Common Order by John Carswell in 1567, the first ever Gaelic book to be printed in Scotland or Ireland, and he translated it into a form of classical Gaelic. As I have demonstrated elsewhere, Carswell was very much in tune with the principles of Renaissance humanism, which flowed into the Reformation. Translations of religious texts, likewise, did not cease in 1820, when my time scale comes to an end, but they continued into the later 19th century and beyond, well beyond. On this occasion, however, the so-called Scottish Enlightenment rather than the Renaissance, is my broader operational context. I say so-called because I am uncomfortable with the term Scottish Enlightenment for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the adjective Scottish seems to stretch the evidence used by scholars like Professor Alexander Brodie somewhat further than it warrants in terms of the evidence presented. What Brodie and others describe is a lowland metropolitan enlightenment, centred preeminently on the cities of Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen. It has little to say about the Scottish Highlands or about Gaelic, unless by way of some hackneyed discussion of James Macpherson and his alleged oceanic forgeries of the early 1760s. The great thinkers, the great intellectuals, were all in the non-Gallic regions. The best minds were usually in the coffee houses of Edinburgh, exchanging wonderful world-changing ideas. And you would search for many a long day to find such enlightened thinkers in the sticks of Count and Beath or One Lock Head, far less in the Highlands and Islands. This model falls into much the same trap as the old version of so-called Scottish history which was in fashion when I was a benighted and unenlightened student at Glasgow in the late 1960s. Scottish, in effect, meant lowland, and the highlands and islands were no more than a minor appendage, if even that, to the important land mass south of the Ochils, where everything of any earthly significance tended to happen. 
See what retirement does to you. <laughs> the, the adjective Scottish also tends to set whatever is meant by enlightenment. And I do wonder about that, type, that word sometimes as well. Tends to set it apart from the rest of the United Kingdom and Europe. The Enlightenment was by no means only Scottish. It may have produced a distinctively Scottish manifestation, but of course it may have produced several different Scottish manifestations depending on location and culture. The Lowland version of the Scottish Enlightenment, centering on Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, may have been no more than one of these versions. In fact, my own concern in this lecture will be with a particular part of the Gaelic-speaking highlands of the 18th century, namely the swathe of territory which comes within the bounds of what is now the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. Most of the scholars whom I will consider belong to and operated in that particular region, and most were ministers, though Dougal Buchanan was a schoolmaster for the forfeited estates and the Society in Scotland for Propagating Christian Knowledge. This was, in fact, a threshold area of the Highlands and Lowlands, which gave relatively easy access to and from Highlands and Lowlands to the clergy and schoolmasters stationed within it. English and Gaelic coexisted side by side, and bilingualism would have been normal to many ministers and schoolmasters, giving them access to English as well as Gaelic literature. I will not be concerned with the more northerly and westerly parts of the highlands or with the islands. Nevertheless, the material which I will consider leaves me in no doubt that the term Gaelic literary enlightenment has a much wider validity as the texts produced in this period in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs area were used by literate and religiously inclined readers throughout the highlands and islands, who would have made their substance orally accessible to other non-literate audiences. I suspect that if you ask somebody with some knowledge of Gaelic, ask somebody today where the Gaelic Bible had been translated initially, that person would probably say Lewis or Harris or well, perhaps Tyree on a good day, but <laughs> very, very few would realise that, in fact, it was a product of the Loch Lomond and Trossachs area. It's quite sobering to think of that. Indeed, the harbinger of what I call the Gaelic Literary Enlightenment appeared from this very area in 1690, when the Reverend Robert Kirk, the Episc Episcopal incumbent of Aberfoyle, and previously of Balquidder, produced his own version of Beadle's Bible, the, the classical Gaelic version of the Bible produced in Ireland. We've got to be very careful with the terminology. He produced his version of it, a transliterated version, in the Roman rather than Irish font, specifically for the literate clergy of Scotland. And Kirk's Bible became for many years the standard Scottish Bible to the extent that when the new texts that I'm talking about tonight appeared, some people poo-pooed them and said they were Johnny's come lately and the real, the real Bible in Gaelic was Kirk's Bible. Though indebted to Kirk's Bible, as it was known, the Gaelic New Testament of 1767 and the Old Testament of 181 used a form of language much closer to spoken Scottish Gaelic. And if you look at the actual language of these testaments, you will find that the Old Testament is much freer in its style than the new one is. There's not so much hugging of the original text. Things have become more fluent, have moved nearer um, the spoken language, even within the period of translation. The availability of other printed volumes of a didactic and Protestant nature in this style from 1750 likewise helped to extend and reinforce the distinctively Scottish Gaelic literary tradition and to establish what we now call 
modern Gaelic literature. Now, if the scholars of the Scottish Enlightenment have locked themselves into some problematic cul-de-sacs from which we feel we must free them for the benefit of their own intellectual health and for more inclusive purposes, I think we have to admit that Gaelic scholars, too, have created their own sets of cul-de-sacs and roadblocks. The 18th century highlands and islands are almost always portrayed as a society riven by political and social woes, most notably the causes and consequences of the two rebellions of 1715 and 1745. The tendency has been to see little beyond a grim contextual scenario, consisting of two ranks of enemies, the inevitable Jacobites and the inevitable Hanoverians slogging it out over the issue of succession to the <coughs> British Crown. Scholarly sympathies, as I perceive them from my biased position, on the whole have tended to lie with Jacobites, and Hanoverian and Presbyterian activities have been seen as an integral part of the regime against which the Jacobites rebelled. On the other hand, it has been argued that the fear of Jacobitism and a campaign to eradicate it helped to drive Protestant religious enthusiasm in the second half of the 18th century and to stimulate the Gallic publications with which we are mainly concerned here. Some would go as far as to say that it was all a part of a big, part of a big plot um, to make the Highlands conform to a wider British model. A connection between their authors, the authors of these Gallic texts, and the post colonial New World Order is certainly clear enough in some cases. But we must also remember that the translating of English theology into languages such as Dutch and German had developed into something of an industry in Europe in the later 17th century, as Professor W. R. Ward has so ably demonstrated. Indeed, as Ward tells us, at least one disgruntled clerical observer stated that the Dutch, quote, have been as bold with our English sermons as with our fishing, <laughs> and advocated reprisals against them. Oh, how beautifully modern. Does it remind you of anything? <laughs> Professor Ward then comments, the plagiarism continues to provide employment for modern literary detectives. That comment certainly strikes a chord with me, as the plagiarism of Dougal Buchanan has kept me happily in ac academic business for a very considerable while. The intellectual world of the authors, or principally translators of Gallic religious works, has been lost to a large extent between competing and often disparaging, if not highly contentious, views of the 18th century highlands and islands. A joined-up case for a link between these authors and the wider Scottish Enlightenment has barely surfaced, though it has made a rather tentative appearance in a recent volume of essays about the pro-Jacobite Gaelic poet Alexander MacDonald, Alistair MacMeister Alistair, who has been called in its subtitle, Bard of the Gaelic Enlightenment. Indeed, indeed. Yes, yes. MacDonald, who had taught in an S SSPC SSPCK school, indeed in several, before coming out as a fervent Jacobite, had educational, business-related and political links with Glasgow and Edinburgh. He knew and used the works of Alan Ramsey and James Thompson, and he published highly original and important Gaelic books, most notably his Gaelic vocabulary of 1741 and his book of pro-Jacobite poems of 1750, 1751, a decade later, Asherin Shenachanen, the first ever printed volume of Gaelic, secular Gaelic verse, indeed secular Gaelic anything, most copies of which were promptly burnt at the Mercat Cross in Edinburgh. Books could be burnt, of course, but ideas could survive, as could the movements at the heart of such innovation. MacDonald's book of poems takes me to within a year of the starting date for the evidence which I wish to present in this lecture. In 1750, the first Puritan work was translated into Gaelic, Richard Baxter's Call to the Unconverted, or Gurum and J. Vore, Ilmbuchug, Agusweet Bell, as it was entitled in Gaelic. 
Richard Baxter of Kidderminster was well known for other works too, some of which were likewise translated into Gaelic at a later date in what became a veritable flood of English Puritan books in Gaelic. The translator of this foundational volume of 1750 was the Reverend Alexander Macfarlane, then minister of the parish of Kilninver and Kilmelfort in Argyll. Macfarlane was a Gaelic speaker who was born about 1703, apparently on the farm of Pulachra in the parish of Buchanan on the east side of Loch Lomond. He graduated MA from the University of Glasgow in 1728 and by the 1750s was deeply immersed in translating religious material of various kinds into Gaelic. Writing to his brother Duncan, minister at Drimmon, well within our area, in March 1753, shortly before moving to the charge of Arachar, he states that, quote, I was closely confined by appointment of our Argadian Sanhedrin, correcting our Gadelian Targum, now in the press, and sent me sheet after sheet per express from Glasgow, end quote. The Gwydelian Targum is a clever reference to the Gaelic metrical Psalter which Macfarlane was revising for the Synod of Argyll or the Argadian Sanhedrin, as he called this august body. The revised Psalter was duly published later in 1753. In the same letter, Macfarlane discloses that he has some other business in hand, namely political translation. Quote, I am just now translating into Caledonian Gaelic the public oaths of the government at the Duke of Argyll's desire to be tendered to all his Gaedelian taxmen against Whit Sunday next. Macfarlane's Gaelic versions of the public oaths of the government have survived in the big house papers and you'll find them in Transactions of the Gaelic Society of Inverness, volume 23 entitled Mirna Kautian Ryuk Moor Vritin, Vritin, Sekir, The General Oaths of the Kingdom of Great Britain, 1754. We thus have what some might consider to be an example of the archetypal Hanoverian and Presbyterian minister carrying out his part in the civilising of the Highlands and getting all those old rogues under control. But of course the same could be said about schoolmasters such as Dougal Buchanan, who was also trying to bring civilization, in inverted commas, to bear on the renegades of the forfeited estate of Strauer. This was the business of the time, and a lot of people were involved in it. <coughs> Yet to be dismissive in this way is precisely what blinds us to appreciating the intellectual power and significance of families like the McFarlands. Alexander Macfarlane's brother Duncan, to whom he wrote as Minister of the Gospel at Drimmon, was a well-known character in his time and could take on any marauders that turned up and whip them, if need be. And his son, another Duncan, Macfarlane, who succeeded him as Minister of Drimmon, went on to become Principal of the University of Glasgow between 1823 and 1858 very much in the tradition of 18th century moderate clergy of the Lowland Enlightenment who often became university principals, and this has been covered by Richard Scher pretty well. For information on the Macfarlands, which I found very interesting indeed, I am deeply indebted to Dr Inez McKinney of the University of Glasgow, whose excellent research into the links between that university and the Gaeldoch the Gaelic-speaking area, is the preeminent example of an approach and a methodology which are brilliantly enlightened in terms of giving Gaelic its due place in the intellectual history of Scotland across the centuries. And we're needing more of that. A flood of light has come in suddenly to illumine this theme of mine. Given his skill as a scholarly translator of religious texts into Gaelic, it is hardly surprising that Alexander Macfarlane was the first choice for another and much more demanding task of the same kind shortly after arriving in the parish of Arachar in 1754. 
This was at the request of the SSPCK, who wished him to translate the New Testament. Mm. We must admire MacFarlane's willingness to even to think about attempting the assignment, as he had been extremely busy with other literary demands over the previous decade. However, he seems to have had great difficulty in proceeding with the work because he had no manse in his new parish and also required an amanuensis. By 1557, when he wrote to the SSPCK, little of any progress had been made, and the SSPCK was becoming restive. A year later, the Society had found a solution to Macfarlane's plight. A very willing assistant had been identified, and he had already made a most encouraging practical contribution to facilitate this very slow-moving translation. The minutes of the SSPCK for 1757 tell us how the Society in Edinburgh received two letters from Dougal Buchanan, the schoolmaster at Drumcastle, beside Lochranach, covering a translation in Erse of the second epistle of Peter and proposing that the same should be sent to Mr Macfarlane to be revised by him, which might be a mean of forwarding the translation of the New Testament, for the expedient of which Mr Buchanan proposes to pay a visit to Mr Macfarlane, and if it was agreeable to the committee to stay with him for three or four months when his school is thinnest, in which time he may, may make, may, might make great progress in the translation. So here we have this man, Dougal Buchanan, um, coming to the aid of Alexander Macfarlane. And it's really this man, Dougal Buchanan, who is the beginning and the end, if you like, of the translation of the Gallic New Testament. He's there to start it off, and he's there here in Edinburgh to finish it as it goes through the press. He is the man who links both ends of this business. So the SSPCK sent the good news to Alexander Macfarlane and said, what's more, Mr Macfarlane will give you 50 guineas if you'll just hurry up with this job and get it done by 1759. There's no evidence that Macfarlane did so. The, there's no evidence that he responded. Perhaps he did. We don't know. But by 1760, the <coughs> SSPCK had reassigned the translation to the Reverend James Stewart of Killin. Macfarlane sadly died in 1764, and it is possible that he had become unwell by 1760, or that the parish of Arachar proved too demanding to allow him time for the translation. Now it's important that we give some place to Dougal Buchanan before we move on to um, the Stuarts of Killin. Buchanan, as far as I'm aware, was the first person to translate any part of what became the 1767 Gallic New Testament. And as I've said, it was he who attended the press when the New Testament was being printed here. Buchanan is best known for his volume of hymns of 1767, which appeared the same year as the Gallic New Testament and were printed by Balfour, Auld and Smiley, apparently when he was looking after the Gallic New Testament. And he can be fitted very easily into the paradigm of the Gallic literary enlightenment. And not only that, but he interacts very strongly with, I suppose, what we could, tell, could term the glitterati of the Scottish Enlightenment of that era. The canon is there with them. And in fact, they seek him out. And this is remarkable. He was a miller's son from Ardoch Strathair, and he evidently went to Glasgow to the Divinity College and was there in 1740. He was sought out by the Reverend John McLaurin, who was minister of the, of the Evangelical Stamp and also minister of St David's Ramshorn Church in Glasgow, having previously been minister of Luss. John McLaurin was brother of Professor Colin McLaurin, 
And whenever the Scottish Enlightenment boys hear the name, and girls no doubt, hear the name of Colin McLaurin, they do this. But very few people have actually heard of the Reverend John McLaurin, his brother. And to my great delight, I did discovered that the McLaurins, these geniuses, had earlier family roots in Tyree. Amazing, isn't it? I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but again, we'll have to research that area. John McLaurin was talent spotting for the Church of Scotland minister, for the Church of Scotland ministry. Gaelic ministers were even then hard to get. And he was writing back to Colin, his brilliant mathematical brother, about what he found when he went. In company where the conversation turned on the most eminent young men about our divinity hall now, I have heard one, Mr. Buchanan, who was Irish from Balquidder, commended as of that number. This made me take pains this day, both forenoon and afternoon, to meet with persons who could give me the best account of him. I did not find the person I wanted in the forenoon, but in the evening I returned a visit I was owing to the master of the college, whom I have heard speak of him formerly. And after speaking about the scarcity of probationers now, and the talk that was some time ago about licensing some of our best young men, he confirmed the accounts I had heard of Mr. Buchanan before, as one of our best students, and particularly as one well skilled in the learned languages and its divinity. Meantime, I have heard oftener than once that he is reckoned what they call too monkish and retired. So there was this genius, this genius Dougal Buchanan in Divinity College in Glasgow. And I owe this wonderful reference to Dr. Donald William Stewart, who has helped me consistently with my work on this theme and wonderful material he has brought to light. And still pondering this one, Buchanan being sought out by no less a person than the Reverend John McLaurin, pretty well the leader of the popular party at that time, an ardent evangelical man. Which makes another point, by the way. The Scottish Enlightenment was not all about scepticism. A lot of men who were at its heart were in fact um, believers in the Christian faith. They weren't all David Humes. That's what you have to remember. The canon was a remarkable man and had already been working for the SSPCK. In 1757, he actually produced a translation, a new translation of the Mother's Catechism. And it seemed as if he could do them like that. Just be asked him, that's that one done, boys. <coughs> Well, to the next one now. That was the kind of person Dougal Buchanan was, very fast, very reliable, and he did this for them. So he was well known to the SSPCK as a most reliable translator. And we see time and again his links with the Scottish Enlightenment appearing. In 1767, he wrote to Sir James Clark of Pennycook, seeking support for the making of a Gaelic dictionary based on the vocabulary which accompanied the New Testament, but which the SSPCK refused to expand <coughs> into a fuller lexicon. He was advocating a tour to the islands to gather Gaelic poems for an anthology. In 1776, of course, we have the Egg Collection. Ten years later, we have um, the Gillis Collection. It's the time of anthologising. And he's very familiar with all the problems that faced earlier people, Malcolm of Duddingston and so on, in trying to achieve their goals. So he goes to Clark, and there's no evidence of the reply that Clark gave him, but Clark was a great patron of Enlightenment figures, including the Runciman artists, a really important figure. Time and again in Buchanan's verse, the Enlightenment in its broadest sense shows through. He's deeply indebted to Dr. Isaac Watts. Watts is one of the best known hymn writers in English, and his hymns are still sung. Watts was also influenced greatly by John Locke, and he, has, he absorbed the formulations of Isaac Newton with regard to the nature of the universe. And Buchanan drew on all of this in his own Gaelic hymns. He also drew on the work of Scottish poets, 
notably Robert Blair, the Reverend Robert Blair. And who was Robert Blair? Robert Blair was in fact a cousin of Hugh Blair, a very prominent figure in the lowland Scottish Enlightenment, the Minister of St Giles, as well as Professor of Rhetoric and the Belles Lettres at the University of Edinburgh. So you're tripping over these Enlightenment references with Buchanan. He's right at the heart of it. And in addition to his links with the Blairs, which seem to be somewhere in the background, it's quite possible that Buchanan actually met David Hume himself because he attended classes in Edinburgh when supervising the labour of putting the Gaelic test, New Testament through the press. So there you are, folks. What a man he was. And if ever there was an Enlightenment figure in the Gaelic world at this time, it surely has to be um, Dougal Buchanan. But there are others, I think. Let's turn now quickly to the Stuarts of Killin and Luss, whom Dougal Buchanan evidently knew extremely well, and with whom he worked on what might be called the unifying project of the Gaelic literary enlightenment, namely the Gaelic translation of the New Testament and then the Old Testament. <coughs> The former, as I've said already, came under the wing of the Reverend James Stuart of Killin in 1760 because Alexander Macfarlane couldn't do it. And then, later on, his son, the Reverend John Stuart, took up the challenge of the Gaelic Old Testament. One of the puzzles, of course, here is why the Reverend James Stuart was given the task and not Dougal Buchanan, because Dougal Buchanan had all the right things on his CV. He'd been translating, he'd been solely reliable, doing everything. But it seems to me that the problem was one of status. Ministers had higher status than schoolmasters, and so Buchanan was overlooked, and he becomes a kind of background figure, appearing now and again as a, a humble scribe to transcribe uh, the New Testament, but I don't believe that was all that he did. I rather think that he pressed on with the work. And in 1760, when the job was given to the Stuarts of, to the Stuarts of Killin and to James Stuart, Buchanan, in all probability, turned up with another sheaf of papers under his arm and said, Fiachin, try that. That's my view of what Buchanan was up to. Now, the Stuarts themselves... Remarkable family, James Stuart, born in Glenfindlas, a graduate of St Andrews, and he got on with the job <coughs> while Minister of Killin from 1737 until his death in 1789. When the translation of the New Testament came into the Stuarts' hands, it moved expeditiously and quickly, and it was ready for checking by 1764. That was a great achievement, folks something that had been held up for years and years, suddenly took wings. And it was undertaken more or less at the same time as James Macpherson's Ossian was appearing and earning the devotion of the great Enlightenment stars of Edinburgh. You don't often hear that. You hear a lot about Macpherson's wowing of the Enlightenment lovies, as we can call them. But you don't hear much, you don't hear much about the completion of the Gaelic New Testament. So what of this old manse of Killin then? Now, we didn't have coffee houses in the Highlands. We had Cayley houses. But Cayley houses weren't the place where you might write something down very easily. But if you went to the manse, you could do the job there. And my feeling is that the manse in Killin was a hub where scribes could come and where a project like this could be done with the right support, the right context. And as I have looked at the, at the Manson Killin and the kind of network that the Stuarts had, I've come to realise that there was what might well be termed a Killin circle of scribes and scholars active from as far afield as Lismore and right up into the Northern Highlands, all relating to the work in Killin. It was as if there was, as I say, an internet of some kind pulling these men together. So it's very, very important to acknowledge that. This was not a one-man show. 
although James Stewart himself was quite happy to be regarded as to be regarded as the principal translator, indeed the sole translator. And the monument to him in Kilin, erected as late as 1890, describes him as Kiat Eterhenger and Chimini Noai go Gaelic Alapani, the first translator of the New Testament to Scottish Gaelic. This is, of course, inaccurate, as Dougald Buchanan was, it seems, the very first translator known to us to produce a portion of the new volume. What I'm sure it tells us is that somehow or other, James Stewart was the organising editor and the focal point for the new task. Now, the practices of the Manse of Killin were passed on to Luss in the person of John Stuart, son of James, who became minister there in 1777 and where he remained in post until his death in 1821. John Stuart, in my view, was even more worthy than his father, with his various contributions to Gaelic Bible translation, to the publishing of secular Gaelic books, and to the study of botany. John Stuart was a remarkable botanist. When he was here at Edinburgh, he took classes conducted by Professor John Hope, and he became well known as the great authority on the flora of his area in what is now Loch Lomond and Trossos National Park. He assisted botanists like John Lightfoot and travellers like Thomas Pennant. And I'm almost sure that in my reading somewhere, I came across a reference to a, a letter from John Stewart to Sir Joseph Banks, who, as you all know, accompanied Captain James Cook to the Pacific to view the transit of Venus and also to observe the cultures there, particularly in Tahiti. Banks was the father of Botany Bay, of course, and the study of botany itself belongs to the wider, en wider enlightenment in Great Britain, and John Stuart was part of that. Now, Stuart, John Stuart, who used to spell his name S-T-U-A-R-T -T, rather than the other one, which was the Killin one, I think, did a fair bit of the translation of the Old Testament, but he was assisted by various other people. Again, not a one-man job, folks. It was a team effort. For example, the Reverend Dr. John Smith of Campbelltown assisted him and caused us douchey when he actually published his part of the New Old Testament, The Prophets, because he was using the latest textual scholarship of that era the work of Benjamin Blaney and Bishop Louth, English scholars. And as a result of this, his translation came under suspicion, and that's why it had to be retranslated in 187 by the Reverend Alexander Stewart of Dingwall. Now, John Stewart was such an important man. <clears throat> His skills were acknowledged by a DD degree from the University of Glasgow in 1795. And he operated not only with Smith and others, but with some people nearer home. And some very famous figures helped him in the revision of his texts. Among them, the Reverend James MacLagan. MacLagan was married to Stuart's sister Catherine, John Stuart's sister. And Stuart... Stuart's version of the Book of Proverbs was revised as far as chapter 20 by James MacLagan. Today, James MacLagan's role in the translation has been largely forgotten. He is most obviously associated with the MacLagan manuscripts housed in Glasgow University Library, a collection of verse of immense value, which contains, among many other gems, important drafts of five of Dougal Buchanan's published hymns, which are earlier than the book, as well as half a dozen more translations of poems originally by Watts, which were clearly translated by Buchanan. In addition to that, MacLagan preserves material by John Stewart, and that material is, some of that material is currently being edited and set in context by Professor Robert O'Malley of the University of Glasgow, and he has given me access to his material here. To me, the MacLagan manuscripts and the way they came together 
with different people involved. They're not, not a one-man show. They're not James McLagan scribbling away for all his worth. He's gathering from different areas. The McLagan manuscripts are yet another indication of the dynamism of the Gallic literary enlightenment. The other equally important assistant in John Stuart's labours was a farmer from Camistradden, Camis and Rahan Lass. Let's honour the farmer. A man called John Walker, who had never seen the inside of a university, as far as I know, but was extremely talented. We have no surviving records of what exactly Walker did for Stuart, but there is clear evidence that he helped him in his labours. We do, however, know that, that Stuart actually helped to publish the poems of Walker in 1817. Walker composed fairly good verse in English, Scots, and Gaelic. And in 1817, his book was published with the warm support of Dr. John Stuart of Luss, probably in acknowledgement of what he had done in helping him with the translation of the Old Testament. I wish I knew more about this. In addition to Stuart support, subscriptions were solicited from a wide range of reading figures, and if you look at the back of the book, you'll find them. They included Walter Scott in Edinburgh and the Reverend Duncan MacFarlane Drimmon, nephew of the Reverend Alexander MacFarlane of Aracha. And you'll find others as well, notable artists of the Enlightenment period. So that takes us back pretty well to the beginning of my lecture and the idea of these ministers as the pioneers of the Gallic literary enlightenment. But one other point about the Stuarts, which we've touched on in that bit about John Walker's publication. They were in the business of supporting other writers and they were going beyond non-Gallic public Gallic non-biblical publications in Gaelic. They were on to the secular ones. When John Stuart was a student at Edinburgh, he was supervising the printing of the first edition of the poems of the celebrated Gaelic poet Domachadban Machgandhu. And he had previously edited MacIntyre's work, which had been taken down from MacIntyre by the Reverend Donald MacNichol of Lismore. And my suspicion is also that it was the Stuarts acting in like manner who supported Dougal Buchanan, perhaps even rewarded him, said thank you to him for his work on the Gallic New Testament by putting up the money to fund his own publication of his hymns in Edinburgh in 1767. Dougal Buchanan was a poverty-stricken schoolmaster. He had hardly two pennies, two groats to rub together. And it has always amazed me that he managed to get these hymns published. I suspect that behind the scenes lie the Stuarts, as patrons of the Gallic arts, as well as major players in the production of the Gallic New Testament and the Old Testament. So to conclude, at quarter past six, three quarters of an hour this one lasted. Let me now try to reach a conclusion. There is no doubt in my mind that the evidence that I have produced in this lecture amounts to at least a preliminary case for believing that a Gallic literary enlightenment was taking place in the part of Scotland now lying within the bounds of Loch Lomond and Trossach's National Park. The region was no more and no less than the intellectual powerhouse which stimulated the emergence of modern Gallic literature. The translation of the New Testament and then the Old Testament laid the foundation of the Gallic societies which made literacy in Gallic through the Gallic Bible one of their main goals and as a consequence new writing in Gallic in the form of journals secular and sacred began to appear in the first half of the 19th century, as Dr. Sheila Kidd has shown us so very clearly in her edition of Nicole Ryan and her many other writings on that theme. So, 
If I have made the case for a Gallic literary enlightenment, may I then plead for the creation of a much more inclusive model of what we can all justly and fairly call the Scottish Enlightenment. Not the lowland one, but the Scottish one. It is high time, in my view, that the major scholars of 18th century Gaelic Scotland, the major poets and others, doubtless those I have many that I have not mentioned, it is high time that they should stand alongside their peers in the lowland south. I pray that in future it will prove impossible to write another so-called history of Scottish literature or an appreciation of the Scottish Enlightenment, which has next to nothing, and usually nothing, to say about them. I salute, and I hope you do too, the remarkable achievements of Dougal Buchanan and the Stuarts of Killin and Luss and their assistants as I conclude the O'Donnell Lecture for 2018, 250 years after the publication of the Scottish Gaelic New Testament and the hymns of Dugald Buchanan, who died in 1768. Ta, believe. Thank you very much.